heard that, he knew he couldn't be saved because he couldn't give up his riches. He wasn't about to give up all his riches. He was very rich to follow Jesus. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? How are they going to enter? They love their riches. For, Jesus said, it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Only a few could do it. Very few rich people ever will go to heaven. Not many. But it doesn't say all. But not many. And the disciples said, well, who then can be saved? We, we all have possessions. And who then can be saved? None of us can be saved. And Jesus said, the things that are impossible with men are possible with God. I think of R.G. Letourneau. He invented all this road equipment you see out here when you drove in. All these big road graders. The big wheels. He invented all of that. But he was very poor. And he couldn't seem to get things to work right. And he prayed and asked the Lord to help him. And the Lord saved him. And he invented, helped him invent all this road equipment. And then he started giving the Lord 10% of his income. It's called a tithe. So he tithed every week to his church. And his business grew. And then he decided he, the Lord had blessed him so he'd give 20%. So he'd give 20% of all the profits that he made. And the Lord kept blessing him. So he said, well, I'll give 30%. He ended up giving 90% of all his profit to the Lord. And then he lived on the 10% that was left over. See, he was one man who fit this bill where Jesus said, with God, all things are possible. In other words, this man made God his God instead of his riches. No matter how rich God made him, he kept giving it back to God, showing that God meant more to him than his riches. The love of money is the root of all evil. Quickly, I think of a scribe they were the people that objected to Jesus. They came to him and said, what's the first commandment of all? And Jesus said, the first commandment is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and all thy mind and with all thy strength. And this is the first commandment. And the second is namely like it, love thy neighbor as thyself. And the scribes said unto him. Now all these scribes hated Jesus. They were the lawyers. They were the attorneys. They were the ones that interpreted the scriptures. And the scribes said unto him. Well master. Thou hast said the truth. For there is one God. And there is none other. But he. And he said to love him. With all the heart with all the understanding, with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself, is more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that, he answered correctly, discreetly. He said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. Not far. He was standing that far from Jesus. If he had taken one more step to Jesus, he would have been saved. We don't know if he ever took that step or not. We don't know if he was ever saved or not. But I have a hunch that he was. I believe he took that step and put his arms around Jesus.
and said, you are the master. You are the Lord. Because he understood that loving God with all the heart was required. Then quickly, protection. We have a divine protection. Angels guard the elect of God. Verse 5, who are kept by the power of God through faith. Angels guard the elect. The reason that God didn't let me get killed when I was a teenager is because I was one of his elect. And he sent angels to watch over me. And the crazy things I used to do as a teenager with my automobile... He had mercy upon me and sent an angel and that poor angel just about got worked to death watching over me. <laughs> Angels watch over God's people. When the king of Syria surrounded the city and the house of Elisha, the young attendant, the young protege, opened the door early in the morning and went outside and looked around and there were soldiers and horses everywhere with swords and weapons. And he ran back inside and said to Elisha, Master, what shall we do? And Elisha said, Do not fear, for those that are with us are more than those that are with them. And he said, Lord, open this young man's eyes that he may see. And God opened the young man's eyes. And he saw angels riding on horses, all around, protecting more than the enemy that was surrounding them. Angels guard your body if you die. If they bury you, put you under the ground, and you're a believer, they don't put you under the ground, but they put your body under the ground. You go up to heaven. But that body is guarded by angels. Mr. Spurgeon, quoting Jude 9, said, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. The devil wanted Moses' body. He wanted to show that he had gotten victory over Michael the, the archangel. And the archangel said, The Lord rebuke thee. And in Jude, what we see here is angels watching over the bones of Moses. Moses had died. He was buried. And the devil tried to get his bones to dig him up. And the angel, Michael, refused to allow him to do it. Angels protect your body until the morning of the resurrection. That's why you don't have to worry about your body coming up because angels are guarding every molecule of your body. Every single molecule in your body, God knows where it is. Even though it turns back to dust, He knows where it is. And He sends angels to stand guard over it. He wouldn't do that if it was never going to have a resurrection, would He? Then a deposit. Every believer has a deposit. When you buy a piece of property, they will say to you, well, if you want us to hold this house until you get your check, you're going to have to give us some earnest money. You give us some earnest money and we'll hold it for you. So you give them $5,000 earnest money to hold it for you. And we read in Ephesians 11 that we have an earnest of our inheritance. And that's the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1.11 in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of Him who worketh all things after the counsel of His own will. Then He says, When you believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest, the down payment. The Greek word is erebon. The earnest of our inheritance. The down payment on our inheritance. Until the redemption of the purchased possession. That's the new body. Under the praise of His glory. You have a deposit. When the Lord saved you, He deposited the Holy Spirit of God 
into your life and into your heart, into your soul. And that deposit is God's guarantee that the rest of it will be paid in full. An earnest. They call it earnest money. I wonder where they got that word earnest. You see, God says, I'm going to give you some earnest so you will know by that earnest that you've got the full payment coming to you. I purchased you on the cross. You've got a full payment coming to you. And I'm going to give you a down payment on it. And that's going to be the Holy Spirit. He's going to come live in your heart. And He will be there forever. A down payment. And that's why I know I'm saved. I have the Holy Spirit in me. I know that. Because it's, he is so real, he cannot be duplicated, he cannot be renounced, he's real. He lives in every Christian. And the Bible says, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. If the Spirit of God doesn't dwell in you, you're not a Christian. You've got a deposit if you're a Christian. He lives in you. Now sometimes you backslide, sometimes you don't pray, sometimes you don't sense His presence, but He's always there. If you've ever been saved, He's there. He's your down payment that the rest of the inheritance will come to you. I have to hurry. I've got two more points. Body, the body, the new body. The immortality is guaranteed to us. We're going to have a new body that will never grow old and that will never die. A new body. Philippians 3.20 For our conversation is in heaven from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto His glorious body according to the working whereby He is able even to subdue all things unto Himself. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. It doth not even appear what we shall be, but we shall know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. We're going to be like Jesus. I try to be like Jesus, but sometimes I fail miserably. <laughs> I need to be more like Jesus. Sometimes I believe I am like Him. Sometimes I'm not. But we're going to be like Him when we see Him. Amen. What will our bodies be like? They will never be tired. Revelation 14, 13, we will have rest. They will never die again. We'll have eternal life. They'll never sin again. We'll have absolute purity. We'll never be unhappy again. We have the joy of the Lord. We'll never ask questions again. We'll have perfect knowledge. We'll never be hungry again. We'll eat of the tree of life. We'll never be sick again. We have an incorruptible new body coming. We'll never be idle again. We'll have responsible service. We'll never be tired again. There will be rest with service. We'll never have pain again. We'll have perfect bodies. There will never be a health problem again. We'll have new bodies that are well eternally. And we'll never be hopeless again, homeless again, because I go, said Jesus, to prepare a place for you. Last of all, glory. That's what it's all about. What's at the end of the road? When I've laid down my burdens, down by the riverside, down by the riverside, when I'm going to lay down my burdens, sang the old black people. Down by the riverside. What's at the end? What's down at the riverside? When the Lord calls us out of this world, what does it mean? You say, I've lived for the Lord all these years. Now what does it mean? I'm going home to be with the Lord. What does it mean? Glory. Glory. Very quickly, Romans 8, 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. Christ's glory is seen in the manifestation of His works. For example, 
when he changed the water into wine, he manifested forth his glory. And when he overthrew Pharaoh in the Red Sea, he manifested forth his glory. His works is a manifestation of his glory. And it's not his essential glory. We're going to share in his glory, but not his essential glory. His glory, no one could share in. And it's not his mediatorial glory, but it's his shared glory. It's an eternal glory. It fadeth not away. It's a given glory. And the glory which thou gavest me, John 17, 2, I have given them that they may be one as we are one. The glory thou gavest me, I have given them. Jesus has shared his glory with us. And then it's a reigning glory. Revelation 5.10 And that's made us under our God kings and priests and we shall be reigning with Him on the earth. I reckon, says Paul, as he sits in his jail cell, cold, hungry, a prisoner of Rome. He picks up his pen and what does he write? For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. In us. Moses went up on the mountain and he said to God, Show me thy glory. And God said to him, Thou can't.